Yeah. So the next understanding was the understanding of... Um, what was it? From dominance. The, dominance, that's it. Yeah, dominance of the soul. So this is a very important understanding, dominance. Would you like to know what it is? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't tell us. No, don't tell us. Yeah, we'll just continue without. And it is a very, very important fact that we must accept if we truly understand our soul. And that is that our soul has been created to, be, to dominate the mind and to dominate everything else. Our soul has been created to dominate every single facet of our being. So we, if, we, if we believe that the mind has been created to be dominant, uh, we will be working in direct disharmony with our very creation, the purpose of our very creation. The purpose of our very creation from God's perspective is that our soul dominates everything that we do. And everything that we become is dominated by the soul. In fact, we are the soul, we are not our mind. Our mind is an attribute or, or organ of the soul. And if we believe ourselves to be our mind only, we are severely limiting our future development. And, uh, and so it's very important to understand dominance. Now, I forget how I've actually written it, uh, uh, so I'll just read it out. It's the principle that the soul dominates the mind and has full control over the mind, whether the mind believes itself to be in control or not. The mind is not capable of ever having full control of the soul, and the soul will always, at some point in our future, exercise its dominance, since that is the purpose of its own creation. So I think that's a pretty succinct uh, way of stating this principle of dominance. Now, if we understand the soul to be, uh, and remember we've talked about in our introduction some of the other organs or, or characteristics or attributes of the soul besides the mind, of which we've talked about love, which is about the heart, humility, another quality. It's, it's also about emotions, sentiments, affections, desires, passions, longings. These are all parts of the soul. They're not a part of the mind. The mind can encourage them or try to deny them, but they will exist within the soul, these characteristics and attributes. So these characteristics and attributes can be suppressed and the mind attempt to go through the process of suppressing them, but sooner or later they will be exposed, sooner or later in our future progression. Now when I say sooner or later, I've known people to go for thousands of years without them being exposed. So it's possible to, to attempt to suppress them for such a long period of time. But, but in the end, they will be exposed. The, the, that is a guarantee because the, the way the soul is being created is that the soul would dominate the mind. And therefore, these things, the passions, desires, aspirations, intentions, the heart, the emotion, the, this emotional, sentimental part of our being is always in the end going to dominate what happens to our mind. So how does it work for natural love spirits who've got to the sixth sphere by using their intellect? Well, they haven't got to the sixth sphere by using their intellect oh. because if they just used their intellect, they wouldn't progress one iota from where they arrived in the spirit They've world. They've inadvertently engaged their soul in the process? They've had to engage their soul in the process to get to the sixth dimension. The way that they've engaged their soul is they've started to realise with their mind that moral development is an important part of their development. In other words, instead of just developing their intellect, they now made an active choice to develop their morality. And, and by that I mean their morality and ethics in terms of love, the expression of their love. So instead of doing the things they would normally do, they've made up their mind to develop parts of their soul and to develop those parts of the soul which the mind accepts. And they've accepted internally that they have to develop their moral code, their internal moral compass, right? And so what they've done is they've chosen to do that. They've chosen to go through this process, through the law of compensation, go through this process, firstly of compensating for all the things they did that were 
out of harmony with love, but then they've also had to engage new truths by releasing errors of concept that they've had about ethics and morals. So they've had to release old beliefs that they've had about immoral behaviour and accept new beliefs about moral behaviour. And they've had to go through this process emotionally. Right? So, so they have engaged a process of soul-based change, but it's been limited to what their mind would allow. So it's only, it's only changing through what their mind would have allowed. Just making sure I have switched it off of mute. And so, so what that means then is that there's this uh, process that they've been naturally engaging without them even really being aware of engaging that has caused them to change and to grow. And if they had not have engaged that process morally and ethically, they would still be in the same location that they began in, in the spirit world. Yep. So they've had to make changes in the same way. They've just not engaged God or God's love or any of God's truths, uh, or, or when I say any of God's truths, any of God's truths about God in the process. They have engaged God's truths about other things, about the moral, the moral laws of the universe and the ethical laws of the universe. They've had to engage those because if they didn't engage those, they would never have gotten to, the, to become the perfect natural man. But do they believe that they are still working from the mind, though? They believe they're still working from the but mind. But they're not. But they've made a heap of soul-based changes, right. which they have used their mind to make. So they, they've used their mind to assist the soul in releasing the error and in, and in getting the new belief. The way they've done that is they've gone through a process of what we often in the spirit world refer to as forgetfulness. They, they've forgotten the reasons for their own unloving behaviour by accepting new reasons for loving behaviour. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they have had to change at the soul level and, uh, and, and they have had to go through that process. And, and that process is still the same like no matter who you are, whether, you, 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 whether you're on the divine love path or on the natural love path. However, on the divine love path is a much more rapid process because you can receive divine love, which transforms the belief systems in your soul as, if you allow it to, if you allow the emotional release of the error as it goes. And this is a very rapid way then of absorbing new truths into the soul because the error is now left and been forgiven and uh, as a result, the new truth enters very rapidly. And so you can grow quite rapidly. But again, you have to have a desire for that truth to enter you. If you have no desire for it to enter you, you'll stay stagnant until you have a desire to enter, to, to actually absorb the new truth. And that applies whether you're on the divine love path or on the natural love path. If you don't have a desire for a truth and you don't have a desire to live in harmony with the truth, then no change can occur anyway. Mm. Okay. Well, um, should we use an example for dominance? Yeah, sure, sure. So the example was um, about violence again. Um, yep. Violence towards anyone is not loving. Yep. And the error is that person... Yes, this is the same one, but yep. different. Yeah. That exactly. person has made me angry, so violence towards them is justified. Exactly. So if we look at this point in the point of dominance, what we're really saying here is that my soul will dominate my intellect and its ability to reason and its ability to determine the truth on this subject. So, so while I might have received a concept, and like I've said in many of our discussions with people, I've talked about pe to people that violence under any circumstances is out of harmony with love. Now, many of them have received this concept in their mind only. So in other words, in their mind, they can sort of see, yeah, I can sort of see why, you know, violence under any circumstances is unloving, right? But then put them in a circumstance which is which has been violent towards themselves, or even a circumstance that is just tri challenging for themselves. Many times they res still resort to violence, and the reason why is because they have not respected the fact that their soul will dominate their actions, not their mind. And while their soul has in it justifications for violence, those justifications under certain trigger points will be exposed. And, and will undoubtedly be acted upon. And, that's, and so they have not understood this principle of dominance. They've not understood that you can't just absorb a thought and have a change. A change has to occur in the soul for the change to actually occur in your day-to-day -day life because if it doesn't, sooner or later a situation will occur 
where the soul reverts to its dominance and overcomes the mind's reasoning ability and causes a certain action to be taken that might be out of harmony with truth or love. And while I believe that my mind is dominant, I'm really in a place that's very dangerous because I'll absorb this truth in my mind and absorb that truth in my mind and absorb this truth in my mind thinking that I'm changing. And I might even choose through my mind to change my actions. And that would tend to indicate to myself that I am changing. But the reality is, if my actions are not automatic, I have yet to change. If my actions of love are not automatic, I've yet to change. So if we talk about another example, I've often talked to people about telling the truth in all circumstances and situations, right? Now, for the majority of people, this this underlying truth of telling the truth in all situations and circumstances hasn't entered their soul because you place them in a circumstance or situation where you know, they're afraid of their family or afraid of their friends or afraid of public opinion or whatever fear is triggered, bang, the truth goes out the window in an instance, right? And they, 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 they might not tell a lie, but they'll sit there, you know, <laughs> not saying the truth either. Now, that is an indication that the truth has yet, that truth of always telling the truth has yet to enter their soul. It's only entered their mind as a concept. And, and until it enters the soul, nothing's really changed. It's just in their mind. Their soul hasn't changed. They haven't grown on the issue. Once they release the error, through, as we talked about through absorption, we know that we have to release the error in order for this truth of telling the truth all the time for it to, to, to work. Once we release the error, which are, which, which are the different circumstances and situations under which we're willing to compromise truth, if, once we release those, we'll never compromise truth in any situation anymore. Right? Then we could say the truth is in our soul, only then. Before that time, it's just an intellectual concept in our mind and our soul error will govern our actions under, under the circumstances. So we get into a circumstance that we've yet to release the error about so the circumstance might be, I badly need approval of others. That might be the circumstance. So whenever that approval of others is threatened, right? because I've not yet released that error, that thing that's out of harmony with God's love and out of harmony with God's truth, because I've yet to release that from my soul, I revert to either speaking a lie or revert to not disclosing the truth. I, I revert to just sh shutting up you know, and, not, and not disclosing anything. And that tells me, that that's the circumstance I need to find the error. If I used my mind wisely, what I would do then is I'd go, okay, that just told me that my soul still got the error. Where is the error? Now, I know through the circumstance that the error is related to public opinion, how people think about me. So that's where I need to focus my time and effort on finding the error and releasing it so that I can have the truth enter my soul rather than it just being an intellectual concept in my mind. So that's an example where the changing your actions in a more loving direction is beneficial, though, because then that um, exposes the error exactly. in the situation. Exactly. So, so if I had really used my mind again to change my actions, I would feel the feeling in that circumstance come up where I can, I can feel I've got to say the truth. I, I can feel I've got to say the truth. And in that moment... I would honour that truth, right, if I have not yet released the error of compromise, I would be able to, if I had released the error of compromise, I would be able to honour that truth and speak up even though I'm terrified. I'd be able to do that, right? But, but because I have honoured my fear rather than honouring the truth, I'm still, this, is, this situation is telling me, ah, another situation where I honoured fear over truth which means the truth of telling the truth has yet to enter my soul. And I need to find out why, what, what the error is in my soul that's preventing this truth that's in my mind from entering my soul. Yeah. Now, I feel that if most people understood this dominant principle, they would realise that their soul is always dominant. And it doesn't matter how much they try to exercise their mind for dominance. In the end, the soul will always revert to dominance. 
And in fact, that's the way God created it to be. God created our soul to finish up being the dominant part of our nature because the soul is the real self. The mind is just an appendage of the real self. The soul is the real us, the complete unit of the soul has all of these organs of which the mind is only one. And while I'm trying to use one organ to dominate the rest, of course, at some point in the future, it's not going to work out too well for me. And this is the problem I feel most people who are mind dominant have is that they are trying, 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 always trying to dominate their soul, their entire being with one appendage of their soul. And in the end, it's never going to work. There's always, they're always going to revert to the soul's dominance at some point. And if the soul contains error, then it's going to be the error that dominates. If the soul contains truth, then it will be the truth that dominates. It just depends on what the soul contains as to, how, to, to what the end result will be. If the soul contains love, then love will dominate. But I can believe I'm loving with my mind, and at the very same time as that, my soul dominant emotions are not loving at all. And you know, we speak very frequently to people. Even we had a discussion yesterday with a group of people where I talked about with them the dominance of some of their minds over their soul. They're, and they're not even aware of their soul emotions until I talk about them with them. Why is that? That's because they're using their mind to think that I'm good or think that I'm happy. Or, and, and it's a very arrogant uh, way of operating, but it's also a very fear-based generally way of operating. And that is I'm trying to use my mind to tell me that I'm a good person. When my soul's actions and the, what, hap, what I do with my life demonstrates to me, actually, I'm not as good as I think I am, but, but I'm trying to ignore that as well. And it's not a natural thing to be loving under those circumstances. And what I'm suggesting to people is if there's a change in the soul, if we understand dominance, if there's a change in the soul, then the change in the soul will be reflected in my day-to-day -day life instantly. And... and and my soul will dominate my actions. And if my soul is loving, then all of my actions automatically are dominated by, loving, by a loving soul. If my soul is unloving, then all of my actions will be pretty much re really, relatively easy exposed as being unloving through that process. And this is where we require some sense of honesty with self. Most people who are, are still in their mind are not very honest with themselves because they're not honest about the soul and its emotions that still dominate their feelings and their actions. They try to ignore their soul all the time. And it's very, very dangerous to ignore your soul in any form of development. Yeah. I was, I was just going to say, in neuroscience, there's actually this whole area of research about trying to get the mind to control feelings. Ah, and there's yeah. this whole, like the whole idea of how to treat anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder is all about training the mind to try and suppress the emotions and they know it doesn't work no. because they put the person and even in animals they put an animal in another situation yeah and, from, it, reverts and it reverts back to older behavior yeah yeah but they're trying really hard to get it to work it's strange isn't it mm. yeah. and in a way that's a reflection of the intellectual dominance of the people doing the experiment and the lack of understanding of their soul their own soul and how the soul has been created to be dominant and what, what we can temporarily or partially suppress the soul with our mind, but it's never going to work for good. It can, it can never work for good. Because it's, it's sort of almost like, I, I often liken it to nature, you know, like you can maintain a home, for example. You know, we build a home out of dead material, for example, and we have to maintain it because we built it out of dead material. So we, we spend all of our time maintaining it because normally the elements will eat the dead material and put it into nothing unless we maintain it, right? So, so what we choose to do is we choose to build it out of dead material and then maintain it. And we have to maintain it. But as soon as we die or we leave the home, we come back a year later and it's a mess. <laughs> Why is it a mess? Because nature reverts to its normal natural process. And in the case of a home, nature eats dead material. That's what it does. That's its natural process. It converts dead material into matter that it can use to support life. So it uses it as food, if you like, for, for life. And that's its natural process. And because that's its natural process, we come back a year later and our house is a mess. 
everything inside is a mess. There's spiders, there's living creatures everywhere. There's, you know, there's paint feeling off, all sorts of things, more so even than if we were in it, right? There's terrible destruction occurs. Now, we say that's a natural process. And what we're trying to do with maintaining our home is work against the natural process. Well, that's, a, that's almost like an analogy for what we do with our soul. We're often using our mind to work against the natural process of our soul. In the end, it's going to require maintenance. In other words, constant upkeep, constant trying, constant, constant demand upon our constant demand upon our attention and so forth. It's just going to be completely overwhelming eventually for us because we don't understand that the nature of the soul is that the soul controls, not, not the mind. Now, if we, instead of doing that, we, for example, with a house, if instead of building a house out of dead material, we worked out, oh, okay, nature eats dead material, but it doesn't eat live material. So if I build my house out of live material somehow, if I come up with some technologies that are alive and build my house out of live material, nothing's going to eat it. It's going to survive for good. I won't it's going have to get to, bigger. It's going to, yeah, it might even <laughs> grow and I, and I won't have to maintain it, right? Now, that same principle applies with our soul. The same principle is if I now start working on my soul, which is, which is naturally dominant, and I promote its dominance rather than trying to suppress its dominance, and I work on anything inside of my soul that creates a dominance in an unloving direction, and I release that from my soul, then what I'm going to be left with is an automatic natural process that I will not have to upkeep. That's what I'm going to be left with. I'm going to have, be able to have no effort in my progression, my future progression under those circumstances because my soul has learnt that it's dominant and everything then as a result respects the dominance of the soul. And then because we respect the dominance of the soul, we realise that anything that we do or attract that's out of harmony with love we realise we have to release something that's inside of the soul so that we can release that part of the soul's dominance that's negative. And so we release it and we're left with only loving things that dominate our soul. Now, that would be a far more logical process to follow if we understood our soul and we understood the principle of dominance. What I feel is that most people still don't understand that principle and they're working with their mind, working with their mind, trying to change their actions, changing their actions. A lot of people have become vegans just because Jesus talked about it on a, you know, on a you know, interview or some kind of presentation. But they haven't had a shift in their soul. What's the point of doing that? Why not stay eating meat and feel guilty about it? That would probably be better. You might change faster there and work out what's going on in the soul. Do you know what I mean? Um, See, a lot, a lot of people change their actions without changing their soul. The best course of action is to change your actions, but always be conscious that unless the soul changes, changing the action is not going to have any long-term benefit to you. Right? That's the best course of action. So when you notice something is out of harmony with law, with God's law of love, change your action, but understand that changing your action is not the end of it. Because unless something changes in your soul that allowed you to perform the previous unloving action, unless that is released from you, your soul has not changed. And unless your soul changes, you're not going to get closer to God, you're not going to be closer to yourself, you're not going to realise the power and potential of your soul. So when I understand dominance, I will stop using my mind just to change my actions all the time and I will start using my mind to assist the soul to find the reasons why I have a certain action and release the reason, the error inside of the soul. That's how I will use my mind. I will focus my mind on using it to expose the error and allow its experience so that it leaves me. Instead of using my mind to suppress the error and cover over the experience, which is the way most people are using their mind. But <clears throat> Because of the way that God's designed it, it's only going to work for a little while. Exactly. It can only work for a while. Now, when I say a little while, in, in, if, we compare, <laughs> if we compare like eternal existence, then it might, might in extreme cases, work for a thousand years or a few thousand years. But, but in the end, it, it cannot work for good because, it, because God's created 
the soul to dominate. And so I've met people who have, not, who, who have got to the sixth dimension of the spirit world who have not progressed further for 2,000 years, but when you talk to them, I can feel in their soul the dissatisfaction. There's a little points of dissatisfaction that the soul's starting to revert <laughs> you know, and start to dominate again. It's feeling, it's feeling its dissatisfaction, the dissatisfaction of not having a relationship with God. It feels. And so it's, the soul is still, even though they've tried to suppress it with their intellect, their mind, and you know, taken it and, all, and distracted it with as much distractions as possible through 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 years of life, in the end the soul is still going, listen to me, listen to me, <laughs> you're not listening to me. <laughs> you know, and and that's, uh, the soul has been designed to do that. God designed the soul in, in a very clever way. And, and, uh, and, and it's been designed to constantly, constantly badger us when it knows something is not right and, and to dominate us, even though we might try to intellectually dominate it for a lot, most of our existence. Mm. So that's the point of, uh, is there any examples we want to raise there? Oh, that's we prob- used that. Prob- we probably is, that. yeah. But yeah, so that was the point of dominance. And I feel if people can understand dominance and then look at, the, so we're now, we've now got the three principles that we've looked at. We've looked at the preclusion principle, with, which is the state of the soul currently. We looked at the, the absorption principle, which is a state of how we can grow the soul. And then if we look at this uh, principle of dominance, we're now looking at what we should be focusing on if we're going to develop. We, in, we need to stop the focus on intellectual development and mind-based development, and we need to start really feeling because remember, our soul, as I've said in this section here, I think I wrote down some things about it. said, the soul is emotion, sentiment, desire, passion, longing, aspiration, feeling, sensory, fervor, excitement. All these kind of feelings are a part of our soul. These are all a part of the soul's organs. And so what we do is we start focusing on the development of them rather than suppression of them. And, and we use our mind now... Rather than using our mind to try and dominate the soul, we go, okay, I give up. <laughs> In our mind, we go, I give up. You are, soul is more dominant. You're, you know, the emotions and, the, and all these other feelings that we described, all these sensory feelings are always going to dominate me. What I need to do is to bring them into harmony with love and truth. That's what I need to choose to do. And now I can use my will, which comes from my soul and my mind, uh, as an intellectual tool to actually allow the development and dominance of these particular things, but only allow the dominance in the direction of developing further in love and truth. In other words, whenever I notice an error, I want to release the error rather than live in the error. I want to get rid of the error from myself rather than stay in it all the time. Right? And uh, I feel if people focus their attention on that with their mind, and use their mind as a tool of the soul to help the soul do its thing, then they would find progress much more rapid. Mm. So that's the principle of dominance. Mm. 